You're listening to Alabama Tradition with Ryan Fowler and Martin Houston on Tide 100.9 in Tuscaloosa. Get 15% off a set of Brake Mess Select, Select Pro, or Import Direct brake pads and two rotors now at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Championships. Championships. 27 SEC titles. 131 first team All Americans. 70 postseason appearances. 39 postseason victories. This is Alabama football. And this is Alabama tradition with Martin Houston and Ryan Fowler on Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. some more Alabama Crimson Tide football. It's Alabama tradition, as I've mentioned many times before. Martin Houston running for mayor of Tuscaloosa. Uh, so he's, he had to because of FCC. So I was looking for somebody to help. And, uh, man, what a what a hit this has been. Getting a lot of great positive feedback. Chris Landry, LandryFootball.com. Chris, I hope you're having a great Tuesday. Welcome in to Alabama tradition. I am having a great uh, Tuesday. Uh, always great to be with you and uh, really enjoying this hour with you and, and the great Alabama fans. A lot of fun. Well, we blink and it, it goes away, right? I, mean, oh, I know. So, I can't believe it. Yeah, I know. It's, yeah, it's how fast it goes. Well, last week, you teased us a little bit and you kind of said, uh, hey, you know, there may be a couple of uh, changes that could be coming. Uh, now we've kind of learned that Carl Scott is looking yep. uh, heavily at Minnesota and that was a big tease from you. Uh, it's, you know, kind of unique how that worked out. Yeah, that's what I was, um, expecting. Um, and I think that's going to go through, uh, I'm always hesitant as things, things change, you know, I was dealing with, um, you know, just to give you an example, how things change, you know, Kentucky, um, hired a running back coach, um, just gosh, maybe two, three weeks ago was with the Bengals. And so he's been with Kentucky and he's already after a month is, he's going to Philadelphia now. So, uh, Jamal Singleton is who I'm talking about, but, um, so you never know what some of these things are very, as they say, very fluid situation, but I, I had a feeling that, that, that Carl was uh, headed and was going to get something. So it may precipitate a little bit of movement and, and we'll see how they, uh, kind of juxtapose things around, but, uh, that was what I was expecting to happen, and uh, we'll see where it goes from here. We've still got a little little bit of maneuverings around college ball, but, you know, the good thing is for Alabama, they're, they're on the top of the food chain, so, you know, it usually means they can go and make a move that others can't go and, and do, and so they're, they're in pretty good position. We've seen what they've done and what the, I think, a really good job with their staff. I think that's going to be part of the tweaking and we'll see what they're able to add here and how they're might able to tweak the defensive side here. Well, looking at Carl Scott, uh, an elite recruiter, I guess you have to be, if you're going to stay in Tuscaloosa, but uh, he really uh, was able to build a lot of connections uh, in Texas, in your state of Louisiana, uh, a guy that's pretty well known in in your community, but uh, he was able to beat the recruiting path and was able to land a lot of great prospects that helped Alabama uh, seal that quote greatest ever uh, in the history of college football. You know that's the thing in talking with them. You know, uh, is this what you want to do? Uh, you're really good at that, and your future is just really outstanding in the college game with your ability to recruit. And that is obviously something that is not part of what you get in college. So is that is that really what you want to do? And and I think for him. I think he wants to take maybe a step where he can maybe improve his status as an on the field guy. And uh, I think that's the the reason why he would make this move. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how it 
it plays out, but I think he's a good young coach. He's obviously learned from a great coach. Um, as you mentioned, he's got a lot of connections to the state of Louisiana. He was the uh, D.C. at Louisiana Lafayette. He's got um, background with Billy Napier. So um, it'd be a good get for the Vikings. As I told them, you're getting a good young coach. And, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, remember – well, you, I know you remember uh, Tosh Lapoy and, and Tosh is good – really good recruiter, and and he felt like that going to the NFL and kind of being a little bit more on the field. Here's the thing that's different in the NFL and college. You know there's not the recruiting, but the best way to describe it is, you know, in college, you know, certainly the ability to coach and develop are, are you know, very, very important. But the schematics of coaching the NFL is much more competitive. Because the difference between the most talented team in the NFL and the worst team in the NFL, the gap is really, really narrow as opposed to college. So you really are under the pressure to even be better. And it's more football, as we like to call it. It's more the coaching year-round. It's more of the schematics. is more of the development. is more of the teaching. You're teaching pro players. You're teaching a different level of play, and you're learning different things. In college, a large part of your job is recruiting, and it is serving that part of it. You are coaching college students, and while it's a very pro-ish type setting at Alabama, it's still it's largely rooted. So a lot of guys that want to go to a level, say like Carl, and he was a defense coordinator – but and, at Louisiana Lafayette, but if he's going to make a move and maybe become a coordinator in college or take that next step, I think he feels like he wants to improve his status as an on the field coach. And he feels this might be a way to do it because getting different experiences are really important. Um, I heard Sark the other day, speaking of former Alabama assistant, talk about, you know, the reason, one of the reasons why he you know, well, the reason why he wanted to come to Alabama and why he took the job as an analyst to begin with was to learn something different. He had worked with a very successful college coach in Pete Carroll, been a very successful NFL coach, Pete Carroll has. But learning a different way is important. It's kind of like being a student. You being a, a great student yourself, Ryan, you know that different classes, different ways, different things to learn. In our world of football coaching, the ability to learn from different guys has been – it's the key. And it's not like I need to learn some somebody better. There's a different way to teach it. There's a different way to know it. And anybody that's been a student at any level, you can always hearken back to different teachers that you had in different classes and how him or her taught you. Those things are really important. And how do you build a program? How do you do certain things? So – I think that's going to be interesting, and I do think it's really served Nick well to have fresh blood bringing in because I I think that's one of the things that, you know, keep the juices up a little bit because you don't have guys, you know, some guys have been there a while, but some of them just had not been there that long. They want to have, you know, their chance. They don't want to be the one that comes in and, you know, they're on the staff and they're not winning a title. They, they want to do what everybody else has done, so there's a lot of pressure to say, hey, and I think it's good ideas are always a, a, a part for the candidate and for the school. And I think um, so. that's kind of my summation of, of what happened with Carl and, and why it's looking like that's the move he's going to make. We'll see. <clears throat> Chris, do they have to wait to the end of the season for you to the NFL because it's different than college? I, I think you've kind of hit this a little bit in the past, but do they have to wait? Post Super Bowl for a lot of these coaching changes to happen, or, or I mean, I know firings, no, but hirings, yes. Or am I well, right? No, there's not. In fact, there's a lot of discussions about making. Uh, and I say a lot of just an, of, of questions being asked. It's nothing that's going on the books in the NFL. You can hire guys uh, just so, soon as the season's over. However, there's some guys under contract. So let's just say, for example. <clears throat> Let's just say that Alabama wanted to hire Jeff Stoutland back just for, you know. Okay. Well, they couldn't because he was still under contract with the Eagles even before Nick Sariani got the job. So meaning they could block him from leaving because he's still under contract. Um, when 
a head coach gets fired, the assistants that are under contract, that have a contract, remain under contract unless they're given permission by the team. So, but no, you if, if you don't, or not in that situation, you can move if you get permission or if you're not under contract, you can move and put staffs together. There is some discussion about whether we should wait to the end of the season, like starting today, to make any of these coaching moves. So you'll wonder if Todd Bowles or – you know, uh, Byron Lefwich or people like that, even Eric Bieniemy, who I know that the Chiefs didn't fare well, but you think that Eric Bieniemy, the biggest, one of the biggest reasons why he didn't get a job. And I know that the whole um, hiring of African-Americans has, has been an issue and that's a part of it. But you know, what's another part of it is the fact that, you know, they're having too much recent success, meaning you, it's hard to get a job when you're, in the Super Bowl every year, like Robert Sala, who got the job with the Jets, I mean, it, he got the job this year mainly because the Niners were not in it, and he was free to go talk and get the job, whereas last year he did a great job. He did a good job this year also, but he was in the Super Bowl last year. So if you're really good in a given year, it's usually tough for you to get that job as an assistant the year that you go to the Super Bowl because you're tied up and no one wants to wait because if they wait and they wait on you and you they lose out, man, they're really left holding the bag. And then, so if you're like the Jets or the Lions, do you want to wait to the end of the Super Bowl or do you want to get that staff done like a month ago so that you can begin studying your team, getting get an earlier start on free agency in the draft so there's a little bit of that going on. So you don't have to wait. But in some situations, for certain guys, you have to wait because uh, the right opportunity, you know, in a case of if you make a changes on a staff, that may make a move that will precipitate another move. So, like, maybe – you know, you get a guy that you're that 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 you know very well that gets a coordinator job, and there's a move that's made, and then he brings you. Well, that may come a little bit later uh, than sooner. So it sometimes it takes a while, and because there's a lot of cross pollination of college and NFL coaches, the NFL cycle is always a little bit later and lingers longer, and that leads to some of this movement, like I just said with the coach at Kentucky, Carl, and, and others like that, that will – we still got Central Florida doesn't have a head coach. They just trying to they hired an athletic director today. You got Tennessee trying to hire staff. So, you know, the cycle's not over. It's slowed down, but, but the carousel's still kind of moving with a, with a little bit of slow music on. And if you've, if you've got a great coach, I guess when you're looking at Nick Saban with a vacancy, I'm sure that probably creates some anxiety oh, around Oh, yeah. With other yeah. head coaches. Yeah, because – you know, again, he has an opening. He can go get somebody that others can't. And timing's not great. I mean, like, like if let's just say Central Florida wants to hire Jeff Levy, the Lane Kiffin's offense coordinator at Ole Miss. Well, it's not ideal to be leaving this late, but if you're the offense coordinator at Ole Miss, you got a chance to go to Central Florida. That's probably – the best stepping stone job there is in the group of five. I mean, you get that job, you pretty much springboard to a power five job because you're going to have success just how much, but the, but it creates awkward timing. It's kind of late in college. You'd like to be settled, but again, with the, the fact that you've got a lot of college guys to the NFL and NFL to college, you're going to have some movement. But if you're in a situation like Saban, again, he can kind of bring somebody in that that job is a, on that staff is a lot more attractive. So he can go pick somebody out. So the, the people that will end up losing is, like I said, the ones on the lower end of the food chain because they may get rated a little bit and then move on. Look, just, just look what happened with South Carolina, and I think that Shane Beamer has done a nice job. But he had three assistants that he hired that were there like two weeks in Auburn hired him. I mean, we're sure. just like, I mean, just, so it's, there's a pecking order. There's, Auburn's a better job than South Carolina historically. They can pay more. Boom, there you go. Well, Alabama's on the top of the food chain to the point where even a lot of NFL folks would be interested. So 
they, whether it's early or later in the middle, they can go out and get some people that can, you know, they can go and make changes. It's never about lack of resources. It's just what the head coach wants and what's the, the type of combination he wants to put in with his staff. Chris, uh, when you look back at the Super Bowl, I want to hear some thoughts uh, of that game and kind of hear your breakdown. We'll stop here. We'll come back. We'll reset everything. We'll talk more Alabama Crimson Tide football. We've been talking a lot about the offensive line here in Tuscaloosa. We'll break that down and a lot more. That's Chris Landry. I'm Ryan Fowler. This is Alabama tradition, the past, present, and future of the Alabama Crimson Tide. You are listening to Alabama Tradition with Martin Houston and Ryan Fowler. Your connection to Tuscaloosa and the University of Alabama Athletics on Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. All right, James Ludeman, you're a Bucks guy. Take your victory lap. Go ahead. Take your victory lap. The old guy still got it, y'all. <laughs> he will be 44 coming up in August. But, uh, Chris, I love to dive into not just the score, but just kind of how did we get there when you look at that Super Bowl, maybe some things that jumped out to you. Well, you know, James and I were talking in the break, and, you know, when you think about this, and this is a, a, a lesson that, you know, it's not how you start, how you finish. You know, you, you never stay the same. You either get better or you get worse. So the Bucks are seven and five. <clears throat> they're I mean, they're they're in danger, even with an extra team in each conference making the playoffs, danger of missing out. They didn't lose one game the rest of the way. Uh, very impressive how they got better and better. A couple of things jumped out at me as I went back over my film grade notes during the during the year. Offensively how much better the running back play was in, in both the run and the pass game. Very underrated, very big part of their success and really kind of took them to a different level. The defense is very, very talented, played great. In the game Sunday, phenomenal. Um, there's no doubt they attacked a very weakened Chiefs offensive line, which was weaker at three spots because they moved the left left tackle was out. They moved the right tackle to left tackle. So the left tackle is weaker. Now the right guard's playing right tackle. They're weaker at right tackle. And they're in Wisniewski coming in, they've got a they got a weaker right guard. I mean, they're they were in trouble. And they didn't do a very good job. The the, the things that jumped out at me defensively. They were able to get home with some blitz pressure, but they did a good job with base pressure. They played too deep coverage, but they played a lot of what we call cover seven. They had two deep safeties that um, was able to help out the outside corners, and they were able to bracket Tyreek Hill. They took away the biggest weapon of the Chiefs, and the linebackers were great. First of all, they used Devin White as a looper and a spy, so that Mahomes could not run and make a lot of big plays. He had a little bit, not a lot, not nearly enough, and he was running around just to try to find some openings. So the Bucks linebackers covered very well, and they didn't have to cover long because the pressure was there. Pressure was good. Linebacker coverage was good. Thought the safeties played very well helping out, and they took – look, it's it's – you did not see Mahomes get to his secondary or tertiary options in his read nearly as much. And then when you're always looking for the Chiefs to come back, because they always seem to come back, coming back against Brady, getting off the field against Brady, they just weren't able to do it. And it was about being able to run some clutch drives. And, oh, by the way, Gronk, who had, you know, some impact, at points in times during the year had a big impact in this game. The other thing that jumped out at me is I'm watching the tape. That red zone offense of the Bucks, that's the Patriots red zone offense. Brady put that in. I mean, he had, I mean, he put that in obviously with Byron Leftwich. You know, this is what we, and, and you see that you kind of see it all come together because what week five, week eight, week 10, even, wasn't quite there, clearly is there now. You get the feeling that if they could, like, line up and play for another six or eight weeks, 
they'd just be, you know, in theory, they really be hitting on all cylinders. And, you know, Antonio Brown had a role. Leonard Fournette had a role. Uh, Gronk had a role. All three guys that were signed after Brady signed. So Brady had a tremendous impact. And I think the biggest thing with Brady is his leadership. I mean, he kind of elevates everybody's game. Um, look, it, there's – just call it like it is. There's a lot of talent, but if – Jameis Winston is the quarterback of that team. They not even we're not having this discussion. They're not where they are. It wasn't about Brady putting the team on his back. It's about Brady having an impact throughout the locker room, making clutch plays when he needs to, but being the ultimate leader, still very capable of making plays with a lot of weapons. Just phenomenal. I did not see a blowout coming. Um, but I was I was very very impressed by him. very impressed and and you know look he's coming back Bruce is coming back I mean you know and we'll, uh, they they certainly are going to be favorites in the division and it's got a long off season a lot of things can happen to a lot of teams but certainly you'd put the the Bucks among the favorites uh, in the NFC next year at least at this point in time with a lot of work to be done in the off season by everybody Chris. Is Tom Brady getting better in certain areas, or or is well, he? Yeah, neck up. See, that's the thing. Necessity is the mother of invention, right? I mean, first of all, Brady did not have a great arm coming out of Michigan. He really developed his body and his game once he got into the NFL. And no, he doesn't have it. His arm is not as good as it was three, four years ago. It's still good. He can still throw it deep. And he's still got an arm that can compete with a lot of guys, including a lot of them 10 years his junior. He's, But he is so much ahead. He is like having a coach on the field. He sees the game. He sees it at the line of scrimmage, post-snap. You just can't fool him. And let's get that Bucks offensive line some credit because – they gave him a clean pocket to operate. I mean, that's the one thing he can't do. Can't move around. Well, give him time. Yeah, Ryan, he's gotten better and better because he's smarter and smarter. It's not like, remember when Peyton won his last Super Bowl with the Broncos? I mean, the arm was clearly not, you know, I mean, it was really not. Drew Brees' arm, not this year, very limited. There's not a lot of limitations with Brady. They can go deep, and look, you get him on play action. So here's the thing. Play action is really good, but with a lot of young quarterbacks, play action is dangerous because when you run play action, you're, you, as a quarterback, you turn your head to the defense. Well, the, when you turn your head from the defense and you come back to throw it, the ability to redecipher the, the look – is, it can be challenging, and that's why a lot of young guys struggle with play action because they get fooled. You're not fooling guys like you know Brady, Manning, people like that. And so when you get the running game going and you can run play action, huh, and you get you get man coverage, like some of the looks that they get. I mean, look how well he ran two minutes. Look at the drive against New England prior to the end of the first half. Look at the drive in the Super Bowl prior to the I mean, it's just down the field, that's when he's best. He's running the entire game, everything at his disposal. He can run anything he wants. And the reason why he's got a lot of juice is, see, when I, I, obviously for your audience that doesn't know Ryan and maybe don't listen to us on Wednesdays, that, my background with Saban and Belichick goes a long way. And I think that the development that would that how Belichick can help grow Brady and every was great. But I think with Brady, he kind of envied the situation that Manning had when Manning went to Denver, where basically he was kind of very involved. Well, the reason why he picked Tampa, A, Tampa has a lot of young talent, and Bruce Arians is a cool dude. I'm sure you probably told your audience, Bruce Arians – was a twice member of the Alabama coaching staff. Um, twice was actually was on the last coaching staff of Bear Bryant before he went on, moved on, and went to Temple and whatnot. But 
Bruce is one of those, you know, he uses the term cuz. Hey, whatever you think, cuz. <laughs> and the Brady's got a lot of free reign with leverage to kind of, hey, let's do this. Let's grow with that. And it's not just what they can do, but it's not what Brady knows but it's what the teammates know and can run. So you make all those side adjustments. It doesn't matter if the guys can't catch up to what he wants to do and be on the same page. It took a whole year. It took a whole season for them to get on the same page. You kind of wonder if things can stay healthy and they bring a lot of the components back, they, they have a good chance of starting the season much like they finished this past year. So uh, very impressive. We're talking to Chris Landry, LandryFootball.com. If you love football, you're going to love LandryFootball.com. They dive into this, the meat and potatoes that we, you know, you can look up at the score. Uh, anybody can give you a score, but you got to dive a little deeper into that and kind of understand exactly how these things uh, work together and kind of intertwine. Going back, something I, I kind of wrote down as you were describing uh, what they tried to do to Patrick Mahomes. When, when you're in a game like this, how much can you – um, go away, vary away from your game plan. When you see that, well, hey, teams are doing this, how much can you adjust? Uh, and at that point, when is it sort of a, like a guessing game of what you think they'll try to do and you try to counter that? Or do they really hit these guys by surprise? Well, I think a lot of what you have to do is anticipate. And I think the best – preparation you have is is i like to call it like the tool belt you have to have the tool belt full and full and you don't know what tool you're going to have to reach for in a given game so you go in with a game plan of what you think that they're going to do against you but you have to have the ability to adjust so to me the science of a game plan is the breakdown and the preparation of the tendencies of your opponent and how you anticipate them to play you the art is the ability to adjust in game, not halftime, but between series. Um, and it's often why, you know, people will say things like, oh, man, that, but so and so came out, they were running the football well, second drive, third, it wasn't. A, that's, a, that's a product of adjustments. I think if you look at in game adjustments and particularly, you know, coming out in the third quarter, you see what you can do. I think you have to have the ability to adjust. So, and I'm assuming you're asking about Kansas City. So Kansas City is not able to block. They're not really built to be a max protection team. That's not what they do. What I was a little bit surprised they didn't do more of, that I thought they were capable of doing successfully early, was run the football more. I thought against the two deep looks, they had real chances to run it. Um and I thought they'd maybe run – they tried a little misdirection stuff, and I thought they would try to run it more. Now, once they got behind, once you get behind two possessions in this league, you, you're, not, you're not running. And so play action's not working because they're not buying it, so you're wasting time. Then I knew once they couldn't protect and once they were down, they're just pinning their ears back. And it's just – you know, it was going to be a tough, tough stretch for them. But I thought they they – they were a little bit too married to trying to figure out how to get the ball out quickly. The, the, the whole key is can you bring pressure and cover off the line of scrimmage the receivers? Basically, you have to take away the outlet route because if you're going to bring pressure and you can't protect, the ball's got to come out quicker, right? Well, if you jam guys off the line of scrimmage, you do a good job covering underneath, you know, the deep ball doesn't have enough time to develop. So you, you've got to do both, take away short and bring pressure, and the Bucks did it very well. And so once they couldn't protect that, they were in trouble. If you looked at it, they tried to run some a little late, but but it was a little bit more of a fool's goal because they, they were so far out of it. I, I thought when they were down 12, they there was still enough time at that point to where – if they had been able to balance it out enough, they had a shot. But they still had to figure out how to get off the field defensively against Brady, which they weren't doing that very well. But you've got to be able to make adjustments. And I think that if you also look at it when these two teams played the first time, the if you look at the score and just watch the game casually, you think, oh, it was kind of competitive. It really wasn't. 
The Chiefs took it to the Bucks. Now the Bucks weren't nearly as good. They weren't kind of the Bucks team that we're talking now. But Todd Bowles had a different looking game plan. They were able to do more defensively, quite frankly. And I think they were able to capitalize a lot on what did not work well. I mean, Hill just absolutely those receivers just torched the Bucks the first time out. So they really did a good job of adjusting to what they did the first time. And the Chiefs didn't – it's not about a game plan. It's more about they didn't have the ability to block it either way, and they didn't do a good enough job, I think, of just – you know, if you can't block it, then the only thing you can do schematically is try to run the football to make the defense – stutter a little bit before they begin to rush the passer. Because if they don't need to worry about the run, if you're not going to run it and they can tee off, it's an easy pass rush game. But if you run right by them because they're upfield and you just run a trap, you know, and against the six-man boxes that they were running and the linebacker, I mean, they, the linebackers were spread out, you had a chance to pick up some plays. And then there's some other things. There were drops. Kelsey dropped a couple of key balls. He'll drop a couple of key. You can't have those mistakes when you're trying to keep drives alive. You know, all those things, they didn't execute very well, but I don't think they had the best game plan in terms of adjusting. Chris, to go back to this game, and not that we had left over defense and just said, hey, we're moving on. We're not, we're not, you know, we're not going to play defense anymore. Uh, but has this changed some of the way, not the way that you guys, I, I know that you're, you guys are not, but. You know, we're talking about score them, outscore them. You know, if you get 50, 60 points and, hey, you got a chance to win. But uh, because we see the trickle-down effect, I mean, maybe people are not going to abandon defensive play maybe as fast when you watch uh, that you can take and, and you can slow down the Kansas City offense. You see, I think defense is every bit as important as it's always been. It's just good defense is defined differently. Good defenses in the old days – where you were running the football was run the football, chew up clock, and win games 17 to 13. That's not today's game. The rules favor the offense. So you've got a pattern match. You've got to get a lot of guys in coverage. You've got to rush the passer. You still got to defend the run. You got to do a lot of things. And, you know, to me, Good defense is not about giving up yards as much as being good on third down and being good in the red zone. It also means you've got to do a good job defending the run because I I think if you, you know, in order to be good on third down, (laughs) there's a direct correlation to good third down defenses are the ones that are pretty good on first and second down. Because if I'm playing defense and you're playing offense against me and you've got consistent third and twos, you're going to have much better third down success against me than if I force you into a bunch of third and sevens. It's just common sense. It's pure numbers. So I think that, and we discuss this a lot when talking tied football, that folks, you know, get it out of your head that, you know, you, you can score, run them down the field and score 55, 60 points and then shut people out to three and seven points. That's not going to happen unless the opponent you're playing is so inferior. And there is some on on Bama's schedule and a lot of college schedule. If you're playing good offense, it ain't happening. You're not going to – doesn't matter how good your defense is. The advantages that your offense has is the same advantages that a Florida offense is going to have. And if they're good, then they're going to score points on you. So the key is, can you get a few more stops? Can you make plays on the ball a little bit better? And so very often what you're looking for is, can you hold an offense to 24 points when you can score 34? You know, that's at the highest level, playoff level, you know, top level. Again, against inferior opponents, it looks like, oh, your defense is dominant and great. Well, with all due respect to Arkansas and some teams, they're just they're not very good. And so – that, yeah, you can shut those people out. In today's football, all level, you, your people are going to score points if they're good because the offensive advantages are going to create that. And therefore, because the, the rule advantages are that way, you are going to kind of create your style to be that way. But I do think 
that if you are good at the line of scrimmage, I'm going to tell you, if you win the line of scrimmage, it, it, it's 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 tough to beat a team if they're beating you at the line of scrimmage. The Bucks beat the Chiefs at the line of scrimmage. They bullied them on both sides, not just the defense against the offense, but the offensive line probably was the untold story of this game because of all the credit going to others, rightly so. Um, I think if you're you're a dominant line of scrimmage line of scrimmage team, you, you're you're going to win a lot of games. So I think defense, Ryan, is is still very important. I still think that if your defense can't stop people, um, you're going to have a hard time winning. That's that's kind of a, a good example of a really good team that just doesn't play good defense, but a really good offense is Oklahoma. And they've been good enough to win their league at times and get into the playoffs, but they don't match up. Defensively, they got a little bit better this past year. We don't know how they would have fared in the playoffs. They didn't make it. But I still think you have to be good. I think, like, Alabama's defense, still very good. But I think the people get frustrated because I think they want to see the defense be as dominant looking as the offense is good. Well, it's not going to happen that way anymore in today's game if you're going up against a really good offense. That's the thing that I've tried to pound into people's head, that you define defenses differently today. It's not about yards. It's about third down and red zone effectiveness, efficiency. I'm going to come back on the other side. I'm going to ask Chris Landry if he was designing an offense to take over in college football or maybe to give other people trouble and the defensive side of the football, what would you run? Would you stick with a 3 4 4 3 uh, would you run spread? How would you use those principles? That's Chris Landry, LandryFootball.com. I'm Ryan Fowler. This is Alabama tradition, the past, present, future of the Alabama Crimson Tide. With Foster's Veterinarian Clinic with Dr. Jimmy Canan. 35 years of serving this community, the name that we've trusted, Dr. Jimmy Canan. Small animal practice providing full veterinarian services only 10 minutes from where I'm located here on Scotland Boulevard, 10 minutes from downtown Tuscaloosa. You'll find Foster's Supermarket Shopping Center, Foster's Veterinarian Clinic, right there on Gainesville Road and Highway 11 off of Exit 62. Definitely worth the drive. The customer service, small animal practice, providing full veterinarian services. It's Dr. Jimmy Canan and Foster's Veterinarian. Get 15% off a set of Brake Mess Select, Select Pro, or Import Direct brake pads and two rotors now at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Pat's Flores in downtown Tuscaloosa, over 55 years of serving Tuscaloosa in West Alabama. They're open 8 until 5, Monday through Friday, 8.30 until 12.30 on Saturday, specializing in that large inventory of fresh flowers, the weddings, the gourmet and the fruit baskets, always an option, delivery options. It's more than just flowers. Pat's Flores, 1010 Queen City Avenue in downtown Tuscaloosa. Pat's Flores and gourmet baskets. Very much. Mild afternoon, a mixture of clouds and sunshine. The high today, 71. For tonight, becoming mostly cloudy, the low at 47. For tomorrow, mostly cloudy. Just a chance of a few isolated showers during the day. The high at 70. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. The host of the game, Ryan Fowler, and the host of the Martin Houston Show, Martin Houston have combined to offer a show filled with in-depth analysis of Alabama football and more. Alabama Tradition broadcasts live on Tide 100.9 every Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. and is available live and on playback on numerous affiliates around the Southeast. Check out alabamatradition.com for a list of affiliates as well as other great content. All right, so we're coming back with a group called The Weekend. These guys performed at Super Bowl. I renamed them Monday morning, 7.30 a.m., uh, right? Monday morning, 7.30 a.m. Listen, as you get older, uh, you disconnect with a younger generation. And every time I watch the Super Bowl halftime show, I realize how disconnected I am uh, between the younger generation. If I was you guys, I'd pack up all that music, take it back to Walmart, get your money back, 
and go back and start listening to Chris and I's music back. And Nick Saban would agree. I mean, he likes the old school stuff. So I just want to, you know, take your take your music back and get get your refund back. Play the Bee Gees <laughs> or something? Is that what's happening here? Uh, Bee Gees would be good. The, I mean, any of those. Uh, I mean, w- the British invasion was great for this country on music. I just want to put that out there. Chris, how about you know? that? You know what? Um, you know what I do in a halftime Super Bowl? <laughs> it's a, I literally use it to go back. I can, because there's no other games on, right? Obviously, Super Bowl. I go back and watch a, a key plays in the first half and uh, kind of I'll, I'll tweet out or whatever some things. I was able to go back and look at a number of key things because when you watch a game live, you see things, you're looking sure. at a lot of things. I'll go back and look at the game. So it, it is so long that I'm able to get a lot more done and able to watch games. I heard it. I don't even know. It's how I, I don't even know the name of the oh, you, group you, that performed. Didn't even watch it. Don't even know. I, I, I don't even know. So I heard – well, he did good and nothing good. It was I don't even know. Didn't in fact, I don't even I don't even uh, see it. Uh, well, to even, even to give the music group a, a a mulligan, they say that it's more of the production because you couldn't hear the voice. I mean, it was it was just it was awful on the directing side of it. But anyway, we it, it's it, it's it's music, I guess, in current generation. So it's uh, I'm oh gonna, yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm but, with you. On that. You know. Maybe this is one of the reasons why Nick Saban, at the age of seventy, uh, that he does connect with the youth, and and maybe that is a, a something that I'm sure he he, try- he does like your music and uh, Belichick like m- music. Um, I remember um, a- after a preseason game in Cleveland one time. I don't know, was it? The Temptations or something. I, I can't remember who was playing. And so, you know, after the game, everybody went up in the box and all that, you know. And, was, I, man, after 15 minutes, I I walked out the back. I had more fun going watching film. Though they, you know, they, and it wasn't the, the, it, it's, it's any music. I'm just not a big into that. I was like, but yeah, they were, <laughs> they were you know, um, the uh, Belichick one time had a guy, so there's this guy at so a friend of mine at practice. Uh, he a friend of his at practice. So you know he says, uh, "Hey, could you um you, you mind? I got to run upstairs. Would you mind just this is after practice. You mind just kind of you know this is my friend here and you know I I can't remember didn't catch the name and he had a gorgeous I thought it was his wife but it was his girlfriend gorgeous and so I'm sitting there talking to him and. And so, you know, I'm just trying to be polite and all this. Yeah, you know, good, great. Oh, man, you're you're in a band. That's great. Where, where are you from? Man, we're in Jersey. And, where you, you know, I'm just trying. I don't know anything about music. It was John Bon Jovi. I didn't know who he was. Wow. Wow. How, how, what an idiot. So the joke was, you know, whenever we'd be in a meeting or something and there'd be some sort of reference, like, I don't know. An Elvis Presley reference, you know, Belichick would say, you know, um, yeah, Chris Elvis Presley was a, he was a musician from Memphis. <laughs> he would be really rub it in like, you, you know, well, I knew who Elvis Presley was. I mean, but I didn't know who this guy was. And uh, that was pretty embarrassing, but I didn't know. What do you do? I mean, you don't know. You don't know. So. Well, and, and trust me, there is <laughs> nobody know. more ignorant on music than I am. These guys make fun of me. They make fun of me. And I, I just play along because I really don't know anything about music. I couldn't. Well, I mean, I felt bad because obviously this guy, and I, this would have been early nineties. I mean, I guess he was still pretty big then. I mean, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm an idiot. I don't know anything about me. I mean, it wasn't like an insult. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I look, I would have, um, well, Elvis was long dead by then, but I mean, I, I would have recognized some, but I, I, I just didn't know him. So I felt like an idiot, you know, but, uh, anyway. <laughs> All right. So let me ask you, and, and, and we've got about six minutes here in the final, uh, last segment here of this show. If you were going in the current trend, and maybe we only cover one side of the football, we go back to the other side the, the next week. You can pick where you want to go. What would you do and why? Offense, or I mean, I mean, anywhere in, in college football. I'm sorry. Well, it depends on where am I? Am I at Alabama, or it depends on what level of programming? It's completely different type of players you can get. So it really does matter. That that's a completely different 
Um, so it depends on where you want to take it. If I'm at Alabama and I can get elite players, I first of all, the 3-4-4-3 three, four, four, three discussion, we'll go defensively first. That's not really all that important. 3-4-4-3 three, four, four, three doesn't matter. What matters is whether you're a two-gap front or a one-gap front. So if you're a if your defensive lineman come off the ball and control both sides of the offensive line, or are you shooting a gap getting in field? That's upfield. That's what matters. Whether it's three or four is not important. In fact, three, four teams play four, three, you morph into different things. So if I could get the elite talent and I could play a, a two gap front, and basically what that means is their job is to control the run by building a wall. That's how Alabama, they build a wall. So there's no way to run. They're not going to go chase you in the backfield and give you an escape lane if some quick back can beat you. They're trying to build a wall. And then obviously that gives you, so you got a wall in front, then you could have your speed guys line up in different areas. So that's what I would do if I were, an Alabama type program. If I were not able to get in, but th- that's hard to do. Finding guys that are, you know, 325, 320, that are strong as an ox, long arm that can lock out the big offensive lineman in control. That's, that's tough to find enough of those guys. It, it, there's not enough of those guys around, even if you get them all, but, but Alabama can do and the elite programs can do that. If I if I was not, if I was somewhere else, if I was at an Ole Miss, for example, I'd probably be more inclined to go with the quirker guys. I'd play more of a one-gap front. So what I'm going to do is take chances, get up field, and, and try to create havoc and make plays that way. Now, it's important to understand your offense has to match your defense. So if I'm going to do that, then I have to have an offense that's a little bit up tempo because if you're going to be a one gap front, you're going to get upfield, you're going to be aggressive, bring a lot of pressure. Um, you're doing it because you're often doing it with leads if, if you can score. So I, that's kind of how I would do it on that side. And then offensively, I think to me, in an elite level, I, you know, I want to be able to run the football and throw it with balance. So I'm going to incorporate RPOs. If you're not incorporating RPOs, you just, you just like, it's like you're leaving money on the table. You're just saying, I, you know, ah, I don't want it. You know, I'm just, it's, it's free money. I mean, they're, they're not basically calling what has normally been illegal for years, and that is blocking downfield. It's an RPO. You can't block downfield. Um, <laughs> it frustrates you, that. defensive guys. I can hear it in your voice. I can hear it in Coach Saban's voice when he talks. Yeah, you can't do that. But if it's an RPO, well, it's not a run. It's not a pass. It's a run-pass option. So if they don't call it, it just it's free money. Don't you? You you've got to run that. And so, and and that's what Alabama's doing. And and so you would keep that. You want to have a quarterback that can throw it accurate. Pars under pressure. Have a lot of weapons. I love tight ends. I love having the ability to have mismatch guys there. Tight end that can flex out. But I want to have power backs. I want to have a big, powerful offensive line so that when I get a lead, I can shorten the game. So when I get a lead, I want to be able to run the football. So that's kind of in short. But if you're if you're not an Alabama, then you got to do you got to go quick tempo and you got to try to try to maybe you know make fast break plays all the time because you can't do what others can do. Hey, Chris, talk about LandryFootball.com. we got about 60 seconds left, and uh, we, we'll try to dive into the other conversation a little bit later. But uh, 60 seconds, tell us about LandryFootball.com. Well, it's a website from a coaching and scouting perspective. Check it out. We think you'll love it. You're thinking, well, what are you going to be doing now? Oh, my goodness. So you've got more information now. We've got all the transfer portal news, certainly recapping recruiting and roster analysis in college. Got the, the the NFL free agency, the new league year is starting soon. All the NFL draft stuff. So right now, I'm just trying to figure out how am I am I going to get enough work done in between now and the start of next football season. So it's scouting season. Take advantage of our scouting season offer. If you love, if you like football, you're going to love LandryFootball.com. Uh, check it out today. All our podcasts, Twitch channel, everything's up there as well. 
LandryFootball.com. LandryFootball.com. Now these guys are making fun of me. Now they're going back to playing this old school music. There's nothing wrong with this. Yeah, that's actually that's actually pretty good. Now I can tell you this. How about this? That is the VGs. Ha, how about that? I got one, Ryan. Hey, can, we, can, could we you need to have? We need to. I got one right. Landry got a right. music question right. Hey, put the box there. I mean, can you can you name their last name? Oh, it's oh, Gibb. G- uh, Gibbs. Yes. Brothers, brothers right. Gibbs. Yes. Gibbs. Maurice, yeah, brothers Barry. Uh, and, 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 uh, 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 the, well, the, the, the oldest one is the only one still alive. Yes. I know that. Yes. yes. Isn't that something? Yeah, Barry. And, and, Barry. I saw a feature on it. Yeah. I saw He's him the at the Grand Ode Opry. I saw this guy at the Grand Ode Opry. I know this is crazy. Rat poison. But, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. <laughs> hey, hey. Landry, it's... I, it, it's, it's always good. I got to get out of here, man. We got like 15 right, seconds. Take care. Talk to you next. Talk to you tomorrow and talk to you next week. LandryFootball.com. LandryFootball.com. We got Ty and I coming up in a couple of minutes. Title talk. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. James Ludeman takes you the what rest of the way through the evening. Title talk here on Tide 100.9. You need parts? O'Reilly Auto Parts has parts. Need them fast? We've got fast. No matter what you need, we have thousands of professional parts people doing their part to make sure you have it. Product availability. Just one part that makes O'Reilly stand apart. The professional parts people. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts.